Good morning, Grace family, and welcome to Virtual Church once again. I realize that I keep saying it, and I don't know how many more weeks we'll be doing this, but as long as we need to, we will be. I'm so glad you're here with us in your homes or wherever you're watching. We are together in this learning and worshiping, and I trust God's going to use this powerfully in our lives. I'm excited because we're starting a new series today, a series in the book of Daniel. In my Friday update, I had a contest to see who could find the two references to the book of Daniel in Hebrews chapter 11. And boy, a bunch of you answered, and I, and I have prizes for the first five of you who got it correct. In fact, let me just tell Timothy True, Aaron Hutchison, Esther Lanham, Marilyn Hartman, Rachel Hinks, congratulations, you're winners. And you just need to email me now and let me know, do you want a gift card to Orion or do you want one to Beans and Cream? And you will be able to claim your prize as long as you do your social distancing while you're there. We want you to have that. Lots of the rest of you answered. It was Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33, where it says, by faith there were those who stopped the mouth of lions. And then verse 34, where it says those who quenched the power of the flame or of fire. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit as we begin our series in Daniel. Well, there's a lot that's going to go on before we get back into the book. We're going to sing together. We're going to hear the scripture. You're going to hear testimonies and reports. And then I'll be back to introduce to us all a series that I've called Hope in Hostile Times. Good morning, Grace family. Let's join together and worship the Lord in song. You are good. You are good. You are good. And there's nothing good in me. You are love. You are love. On display for all to see. You are light.
Greetings, church family. My name is Jim Amstutz, and it's my privilege to lead the deacon team here at Grace Baptist Church. Because we care for you and your family and the Cedarville community, we are committed to assisting and caring for you. We want to make certain that every connection to our church experiences the loves and support of Jesus and the whole congregation. We want to be known throughout our community as a loving and caring church. To that end, we've been working to coordinate our resources so that we can continue to show the love of Jesus to those around us. The care and benevolence teams have been on the front lines of addressing many of the needs and thinking of ways that we can continue to care for those with needs. ABF and small group leaders have been creatively connecting with their groups not only to touch base, but to also be there to care for their needs as well. Many of you have volunteered to assist if needs come up. We thank you. Many of you have given ideas and helped implement them. We thank you. I'm sure that many of you are simply touching base with friends, with family, and with neighbors, and helping if you can. Keep it up. We thank you. As you can see, caring for each other is not a one-person effort. It takes all of us in doing our part. So if someone comes to mind right now, I encourage you to reach out to them. Give them a call, email them, send them a card, and pray with them. These are very important and simple ways to show that you care. If we can be of any assistance to you or a community member, please contact the church office. We stand ready to serve you and those in our community. During this time of uncertainty or even frustration, let me encourage you by reading from Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. May this be our heart's cry always, knowing that God is sovereign over all. It is a pleasure to serve King Jesus by caring for you. We love you, we miss you, and we cannot wait to be back together soon.
Hey, Grace family, I'm Jason Lee, one of the elders here at Grace. It's great to be able to hear the preaching of God's word and to sing his glorious praises together. But also a part of our worship is for us to be able to give. And that's been hard to do in these days. And so some of you have wondered, how can I give to the ministries here at Grace? Well, there are three ways I'm gonna mention to you. First, you can go give online. You would just go to gracecedarville.org slash give, and you can give that way. Secondly, you can text your gift. What you would do if you would, you would text Grace Baptist OH to 77977. That's Grace Baptist OH to 77977. And the third way, and I love this, how many churches have an old bank building on their property? Well, we're making use of the overnight deposit box. If you want to go there, write a physical check or drop something in that box, there's instructions there. You can put it there. It'll be secure for you. And then we can pick that up at another point. There's another thing I want to mention to you, and that is uh, giving testimony. We want to give testimony of God's good work. God is still working in and around us. So maybe you'd like to share testimony with your church family about that. If you do that, we'd love to hear about how God's at work in you or maybe your family's life during the quarantine. If you would, shoot a video, three minutes or less, and then if you would then send that to us, we can use it either in one of our virtual gatherings or through our Grace social media. If you would, you've received an email about this, but you could send your video to Kenton Durham. That's Durham K at gracecedarville.org. God, we do pray for these needs, the needs that uh, we hear about from around the world, the needs that we're aware of in our own community. Lord, we pray for Margaret Green as she's at home and also for the Callens. So Mrs. Callen has transitioned there to friends Yellow Springs. Uh, pray for Mary Ellen's surgery at OSU. Lord, there's so many other needs in our church and in our community that we're aware of. The deep grief that some are still struggling with as uh, they've had th those that they care about have passed away and have been unable to mourn in the ways that we're typically able to grieve together. And these have been hard things, Lord. Lord, I do also pray that you would continue the work of ministry around here, that we would find good ways to minister to our neighbors, their physical needs, as well as their spiritual needs. Lord, we know that these days of isolation have actually revealed some things in our own hearts about where our struggles are, where our hopes had been placed. Lord, many of us have recognized that our comfort and our convenience has often been the things that we've patterned our lives around. And now that those have been taken away, Lord, it has exposed some pride and unbelief in our hearts. And so, Lord, we turn those things over to you as a church family. Our hope is not for success, but is to be able to instead see the faithful work that you do in our hearts through your word, through the gospel message, and through the fellowship of other believers. So help us to find ways to do that. Encourage each other in the word and in conversation, even as we maintain the proper distancing protocols. Lord, we know that you are in control of all things. And in these days, that is a hope for us, that we can turn to a good God who is faithful and true and rules above all things. And Lord, so we as a church gather even virtually here today for that purpose, to declare your praise and to hear your good word to us. So Lord, open our hearts, minds to your truth, even as we declare your praise. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. God bless. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart i know that while in heaven he stands no tongue can bid me Depart, no tongue can bid me then depart. When sin.
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased, by his blood my life is hid with christ on high with christ my savior and my god with christ my savior and my god one with himself i cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. We keep talking about just how unique the circumstances that we find ourselves in are. This is truly a difficult time. But you know, before the pandemic began, there were some things that were pretty hard. And after it's over, whenever that's going to be, there will be some pretty hard things that we'll face as well. In fact, if you start thinking about it, you have to realize things just are pretty tough right now in our culture and in our day. Science is the current God. We don't worship science, but most of our culture does. You invoke the name of science and people think, okay, that, that settles the question. Uh, when our governor does his news conferences, we hear that we have to follow the science. We have to have, do good science. And yet there's all sorts of question that's being raised. And I think the longer it goes, especially on social media, people are beginning to ask, is this good science or not? Is sheltering in place a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't know. But there are a whole lot of people who are trying to question the science or say there's different science. But, but the one thing you can count on is if the scientific community dismisses something, it's going to be thought of as either insignificant or insane. Just try and be a creationist today and see what happens in the scientific community. Not only is science the current God, economic uncertainty is facing all of us. We have seen how we can go from an economy where everything is booming and everything is looking great to a situation in just a few weeks that rivals the Great Depression. 22 million Americans filed for unemployment in the last month. That is Great Depression kind of statistics. And frankly, it took the United States over six years to come out of the Great Depression. Is that what's facing us? Is that what's coming? We don't know. Nobody really knows. We are so thankful that here at Grace, the faithful giving of his people has allowed us to continue with ministry and continue supporting our missionaries. But we're hearing from ministries, including some of our missionaries, who are being told by other donors they have to stop. They can't continue. Uh, they, they have businesses that support them and support missionaries, and those businesses are shut. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what things will be like on the other side of this pandemic economically. I don't want to sound like a complainer, but the fact of the matter is society 
is against us, especially as believers. You know, we are not seen as generally benign or helpful people anymore. In fact, in the pandemic, when, when people are struggling and Christians show up to help, that doesn't guarantee they'll be received well. Just look what happened with Samaritan's Purse in New York City, a Christian ministry that goes around the world feeding people, uh, coming into emergency situations. They set up a field hospital in Central Park. But then it's discovered who it is that set it up. And every politician who signed off, every, every city official who signed off on having Samaritan's Purse come in and build this hospital and staff this hospital with Christian volunteers who are putting themselves at risk, they start attacking Samaritan's Purse. In fact, I heard one who basically said it was a sin, and he used that kind of language, that, <laughs> that people in New York City were reliant on the charity of such bigots. I mean... Really? Even when we as Christians come to help, we can be attacked. And again, I, I suppose we shouldn't be too surprised by this, but the fact of the matter is, Christians have always been known for stepping forward in these situations. And if we stepped away, we don't see a whole lot of secular or atheistic or, or other groups stepping in to help. Even so. Society doesn't like us. Now, I also have to say, in this day and age, especially because of social media and, and the quick ways in which things can be promoted, God's people can and do make Him and the rest of us look bad. Just consider all the stories of the churches that went ahead and said, we're going to trust God, we're going to meet, and in the middle of this epidemic, they've spread it. And, and in some cases, I know of one church where they said 40 people who were in that congregation contracted the disease because they continued to meet. In this day and age, we find as Christians, when it comes to the levers of power, we are gen generally powerless. Now, I know that right now we have a, a, a president and a government that seems to be more favorable to some of the things that we favor. But you know as well as I do, number one, that may, may not be motivated by a genuine motivation. And, and more than that, it could change in the next election. Fact of the matter is, we can't control things. We certainly can't control the pandemic. We, we have nothing to say about the, uh, the decision whether or not the, the economy will open up again. We simply are in a situation where we have to follow the directives of others. It's not fun to feel powerless, is it? All of these things combined make it difficult in this day and age to live as a, a bold Christian, maybe even as a, as a known Christian, which is why so many people choose not to. It's the right time to be a bold Christian, but it's not an easy one. As I think about some of the challenges that we face and, and how do we as Christians navigate the, the, the challenges before us, my mind and heart has been drawn to a book of the Bible about a man who faced circumstances that were every bit as difficult as ours, probably worse and yet found himself able not only to navigate those times, but to thrive in them. Personally, culturally, nationally, he lost everything. Everything he valued was taken away. And yet, standing almost alone, he not only fought back against a hostile environment, he thrived in it. And he made God's name great. It's Daniel and the book of Daniel. Why Daniel? Well, before we get into all of the answers why, let me just deal with two things, two sets of thoughts that may be in your head when you think of the book of Daniel and you think that's what the book of Daniel is about and you need to have your thinking stretched just like I do. 
There are two popular views of Daniel that capture most minds. The first one takes us back to our childhood where we think about Daniel as one of the great Sunday school heroes. Now, I am in the middle of our media for today. You notice the TV screen is gone. I've opted to go back just a little bit into flannel graph. This is the way we had media when many of us were growing up in Sunday school. And here you see two of the most popular stories that ever came to us in flannel graph. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Oh, and what's this place with lions? Ah, well, we put this man here and we now know this is Daniel in the lion's den. Now, I grew up learning these stories. In fact, these were two of our favorite stories as we thought about the story of the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace and that great statue that they wouldn't bow down to and, and Daniel seeing the mouths of the lions closed. What kid doesn't love a story like that? These are incredible stories and we need stories like this to, to see the power of God. The problem is, if this is the way we view the book of Daniel and, and our understanding of the book is shaped this way, then it's going to be consigned to the role of being a storybook. Not just Daniel, much of the Old Testament and even some of the New is treated like a storybook. Not that you don't believe these things are true, but it's only meant to teach simple lessons like trust God or, or stand up for the right thing. Don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with learning to, as the old song said, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose clear, dare to make it known. We used to sing a song that had those lyrics and, and reminded us of Daniel. But it's not just that God is going to get you out of the fiery furnace or get you out of the lion's den. If that's the theme of Daniel then God owes a whole lot of apologies to a whole lot of people who didn't get delivered. In our contest that we had, we highlighted Hebrews 11, 33 and 34 where it says, by faith, there were those who stopped the mouth of lions here or they uh, were able to quench the power of the flame here. But the fact of the matter is, Hebrews 11 also talks about people like as tradition says, Jeremiah and Isaiah. Jeremiah supposedly stoned to death. Isaiah sawn in two. That never made flannel graph. That was never something that we talked about. I, I, I don't know why. I, well, I do know why. Because faithfulness is so much more than just seeing God bring great deliverances. Let's not consign Daniel to the, to the role of storybook hero. Sunday school hero. He is so much more. The second deficient view of the book of Daniel has not to do with being a Sunday school hero, but rather the fact that the book is all about end times prophecy. When I was in junior high, I began to read the book and I remember prophecy conferences we would have and I remember charts like all of these that would be, would be brought out by speakers or brought out by others. And, and end times prophecy was in fact a big deal when I was growing up. During that time, Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth had captured the imagination. A really cheesy Christian movie uh, came out portraying the uh, rapture and I still remember the song life was filled with guns and war and everyone got trampled on the floor I wish we'd all been ready we loved prophecy and of course Daniel's book is filled with prophecy and so we looked at this book and we thought this is this is where we can figure out what's going on and and boy did we but you know as people got into this and began to differ on different aspects of it, and as time went on and the Lord didn't come when we were absolutely sure He was going to come, it kind of fell into disfavor. Not just prophecy, Daniel. We, we didn't study Daniel as much anymore. And, and frankly, 
people just kind of figured, well, why bother? We, we know about the prophecy until pretty much we didn't know about the prophecy. You see, the problem with viewing this book as an end times prophecy book is either you're not interested because you think that's just so confusing, nobody really understands what's going on, or you could get caught up in trying to pinpoint every single event, every single character. Now, when you do that, you're going to get frustrated, and, and when you ignore the book, you have to understand you are depriving yourself of a portion of Scripture that is meant to help us see not only God's great power, but, but to see how God's Word is so reliable. There are prophecies, I will grant you, that are, that are hard to understand, but, but so that you don't give up hope, there are sections of this book that have prophecies that were given hundreds of years before they happened that were fulfilled to a T so much so that liberal scholars refuse to believe that Daniel could have written this book. I don't want you, and I don't want any of us, I don't want myself, I don't want us to, to ignore the messages Daniel gave, both about the future and how we are to live in light of it, trusting our powerful God. But I want to suggest to you that this unique book has a wide array of lessons to teach and truth to impart. It isn't just simple Sunday school stories and it isn't just confusing or sometimes obscure sets of predictions and visions. This is a book that gives an explanation for what's going on when God's people are defeated. For what's going on when His promises seem to be being undone and evil is winning. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? This book speaks to that. And it is a guidebook on how believers, though outnumbered, can as one book puts it, thrive in Babylon. Now, let me share you some of the basic details about the book of Daniel. First of all, I want to let you know about the unique character of the book. This book stands apart. And as we begin our study of this portion of God's Word, we will see just how unique its message is. Let me give you some of the basic details. Now, this is an overview we're doing. I'm going to point out some things in the text, but we're going to really dig into the text next week. So this is to get you ready for that. Let, let's talk about the unique character of this book. It, it's a book that um, is different than any of the other books that we would try to classify it with. For example, how do we learn who the author is? Well, Daniel's a prophet, but unlike all the other prophets, he doesn't identify himself. If, do you remember if, if you go to Jeremiah, you go to Ezekiel, you go to Isaiah, it's, it's, it's the word of the Lord to the prophet, and it gives it the name, and it usually talks about the kings who are ruling. Daniel doesn't start that way. In fact, you have to kind of piece together throughout the book who the author is. You see first-person material in chapters 8, 9, 10 through 12, but that's over halfway through the book. There's personal material that only Daniel could have known in chapters 1 and 2 and 4, 5, and 6. He's not in chapter 3, but he seems to have intimate knowledge of what's going on there. But more than that, he's not even the author you'd expect to write a book like this. You wouldn't expect this person to be writing. The other prophets were, well, Prophets, they were, they were holy men. Their lives were given over to speaking for God. Daniel's primary calling was not prophet. His primary work was not religious. He worked for the government. He, he had been captured and brought into Babylon, into the, into the corridors of power, and, and was made a, a, an advisor. He was made a wise man. He had great influence, but, but he had a, quote, secular job. And yet, he's the one writing. Untrained in theology beyond what he would have gotten in his home. What kind of book is this? Well, in our Bibles, 
we classify Daniel with the prophets. With, and in fact, he's considered a major prophet. Now, when the major prophets are the longer books, minor prophets are shorter books. Daniel kind of falls in between there at 12 chapters, but, but he's considered one of the major prophets. But that's not the way the Hebrew Scriptures categorize the book. In fact, Daniel isn't in the prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures. He's in what are called the writings. Now, the writings are wisdom literature, they, they, it includes the Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and, and Song of Solomon. It, it, it is wisdom that is, that is there. And, and here's Daniel. Well, why? Well, Daniel has some of, the, some of the most interesting prophecies that you can find. But Daniel also is about how to live and how to understand what's going on in a circumstance that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Remember, the book of Daniel is written in a, in a circumstance where it looks like the God of Israel has lost and the gods of Babylon have won. And so there's wisdom to be found here. There's also prophecy to be found here. In fact, some people don't just look at the prophecy and consider it prophecy. They call it apocalyptic because Daniel, like a New Testament book, Revelation, have visions about truth having to do with things that are unfolding, often involving the future, but involve fantastic creatures or things that, that you otherwise would never even imagine. So it's, it's a book that's hard to classify. It's a book that speaks a number of languages. Now, it's one of, I believe, two books that are divided into two sections linguistically. Daniel starts in Hebrew, and then chapters 2 through 7 are in Aramaic. And then chapters 8 through 12 are back in Hebrew. And, and we're going to see that the Aramaic section, which was the Gentile language, really talks about Gentile kingdoms. But chapter 1 and chapters 8 through 12 really talk about how this all pertains to God's people, Israel. So we have these different languages that set up part of the way we would think of the book. But there's another language that's spoken. It's the language of power. Remember I said that, that God seems to have lost here. In, in the minds of the Babylonians, in the minds of, of the world of that day, the, the gods were associated with their people and specifically with their armies. And whoever wins, well, it's because that God is more powerful. To the watching world, Yahweh had lost. Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon had come and taken the vessels out of the temple. Later on, they're going to take more of the people until they finally, in 586 B.C., destroy the temple. Now, Israel understood some of that. Moses had warned them if they were faithless to God, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 28, that God would scatter them. But but, you know, it doesn't really help to tell a watching world, well, there's a theological reason behind why we lost. We, 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 we understand that. That doesn't help. The world just looks at you and says, you're losers. Do you ever feel that way in this world? You're trying to explain spiritual truth and people are looking at you saying, oh, yeah, right. Well, that's what's going on. So Daniel is written to speak the language of power. Because what Daniel does is he shows who really has power. We're going to see that over and over again. When is this book set? Well, I've already kind of told you. If you look at the first verse, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, 605 B.C., Jehoiakim's third year, it's actually the year Nebuchadnezzar will become king. He actually invades while he's still crown prince. His father dies while he is invading, and he rushes back to Babylon to, to take the crown in 605 B.C. It's a time where successive kings have failed. The last good king, Josiah, Jehoiakim's father, had been honoring God, but then had gone to fight in a battle in, in, in uh, response to the fact that he had a covenant arrangement to, to do so, to fight with his ally. Well, he was fighting against the king of Egypt, and he lost, and he died. Last good king. 
the next kings are all related to, to Josiah, sons of his, um, or a, a grandson in one case. But they're all equally wicked. Jehoiakim is just the last in a number of failed kings. The whole ruling class of Israel was corrupted. We'll talk more about this next week as we look at the circumstances. But the people really didn't believe they could lose. They'd been surrounded by Assyria when Hezekiah was king. Everything but Jerusalem was surrounded. But God had shown up and destroyed the Assyrians. And uh, so they thought they were beyond being touched. But they weren't. The people had bought into syncretism. They were worshiping God, but they were mixing it with the worship of idols. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both speak of this. And so we get this book, prompted and written at the end of Daniel's life. We know that because all of these things had happened and he gives us a date very late in his life where he's still writing. And he seeks to give an explanation of what does it mean that Jerusalem was taken? Does it mean that Babylon's gods were stronger? No, not at all. This book reveals the Lord's sovereign power in every chapter. And what's interesting is over and over again, the power of God is, is described from the mouths of pagan kings. Pagan observers have to say, truly, the Lord is this. The Lord is that. We'll see that as we make our way through the book. Now, what set this man Daniel apart? Where, where did he get what he got? Well, certainly God was at work in his life, but there, there is a logical conclusion we can draw. Daniel, before this captivity, must have been in a family that was rare in that day, a family that followed the instruction of Deuteronomy 6, teaching their children diligently the statutes of the Lord, so that when Daniel was taken off into captivity and faced with decisions, he knew what to do because he knew what God's Word says. We'll see next week that he was a youth. We'll see just how young that is. But we'll see that as a youth, Daniel had real faith in God. There really is no other explanation. He knew God's Word and he trusted his God. So why do I think we need to study Daniel now? Well, <laughs> I think it gets more and more obvious. Brothers and sisters, we live in hostile times. We live in times where society is, is not in our favor. We live in times when our ideas have fallen out of favor. And when we try and assert biblical truth about history and creation, about the created role of gender and male and female, when we try and talk about the fact that there is such a thing as sin that separates people from God and, and there's only one way for the problem of sin to be dealt with, we face the hostility of the world. Why? Well, because we are engaged in the same cosmic struggle Daniel was. Babylon had been Israel's enemy, but Babylon had been God's enemy long before. Go back to Genesis 11, and you find a city being built called Babel resistant to God's desire for people to spread throughout the earth, people say, no, we will make a name for ourselves. We will make a city and a tower that reaches up and can grab hold of and seize the throne of heaven. Whether it's Babel in Genesis 11, Babylon here in Daniel and, and in Kings and Chronicles, Rome in the time of Jesus, which Peter significantly calls Babylon in 1 Peter 5, 13. She who is in Babylon greets you. Or whether it's getting all the way to the end of the Bible and seeing Babylon the Great arrayed against God in Revelation 17 and 18. The cosmic struggle against the city of evil 
continues. There is an organized city, a system, if you will, that is organized against God and against His truth and against His people. And so really, this age that we live in, it's more dangerous and difficult than we know. You, you, we think we're upset because the media is against us. The media is nothing. Satan goes about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is the dangerous place. So like Daniel, we need to know our God. Sadly, like in Daniel's time, it appears to many people that God is weak. We see that in, in the way that people dismiss the idea of God, mock God, and even God's people all too often seem to be those who, when they pray, it's like, well, God, if you can. In fact, when we pray, we constantly insert the phrase, if it be your will. And I know that we want it to be God's will, but, but isn't praying always understood to be in His will? I think we say it half the time because we don't believe God is going to show up, so we want to get Him off the hook even before He doesn't answer our prayers. We view God as weak. And in this cosmic struggle, we're in danger of losing heart. It's interesting that in the Scriptures we see over and over again warnings to not lose heart, to not give up, not to be weary in well-doing. Because if we become weary in well-doing, <laughs> we, will, we will give the world reason to rejoice. We may be tempted with all the hard things that are going on to simply hide out and hold on. There have been any number of groups of Christians who've said, this world is so evil, you can't do anything with it. You just need to pull away. We need to live in our own community. We need to live separate from the world. My wife and I watched a, a a series that was recommended to us, I think it's on Amazon Prime, called Gloria Vale, about a bunch of Christians who in New Zealand who live off in their own community and, and dress the same and sing and, and, and praise God and, and everything is, is built around God. And, and the one thing you wonder is with all this Bible knowledge, how come, how come they're not out telling anybody about Jesus? You know, they're saying, no, it's an evil world and, and we have to be away from it. Brothers and sisters, Daniel didn't take that approach in fact Daniel would probably be kicked out of some of the churches I grew up in because he was fully engaged in that pagan world he became a wise man in Babylon so much so that the Babylonians recognized it and said he needs to be in charge he was able to thrive in that environment we're in danger of seeking to hide out and run away so we need to study this book so that we can learn how to thrive in Babylon like Daniel did through a clear vision of who is in control now. This book teaches God's sovereignty over and over again. We see God present and active all the time. We learn that God is a patient but certain judge. God's plan is being worked out as the details of the prophecies of Daniel show us and God is at work even when it doesn't look like it. Even when we think He's losing, He's not losing. We need to learn to thrive in Babylon through a confidence that empowers risk so that when confronted with the claims of the world, we can say, no, I'm not going there. And when they say they'll punish us, we'll say, go ahead. Our God can take care of us, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. But they said, and even if He doesn't, we're still going to follow Him. They had a confidence in their God that empowered risk. And they had an understanding through the wisdom God gave them of whose power would be ultimately victorious. The faith trail of Daniel covers 72 years in his book. 
It's this kind of faithfulness we want to gain insight into as we study it together. A faithfulness that carries a youth. And we got a lot of college students. I hope many of you are with us. And we've got a lot of high school and junior hires. You need to understand this is for you. And we got a lot of senior saints. Friends, this is for you. Because we see Daniel start as a youth. He serves for apparently 72, 73 years. And he's still going at the end of the book. He's still making a difference. How? Well, his faith trail is seen throughout the book. His, we see his resolve to live the way God asks him to in chapter 1, meaning he knew and was willing to obey God's law, meaning that, that he would gain the wisdom of Babylon because he was supposed to. He did that and he excelled. And it meant that he had hope in God to honor his word. So that when he obeyed him, he could trust God. That trust is seen in God's sovereign control in chapter 2 where, where he's convinced God will give an answer to the great need to know what the dream was and what it means. And he praised God once he received that answer. His compassion seen in chapter 4 toward the man who had brought such great heartache into the life that he had, the life of his people, and yet he was a man of compassion. Chapter 5, a man who was bold in speaking truth to power. A man who was so consistent in his living that in chapter 6, his enemies said, the only way we can get to him is to make his worship of his God illegal. In chapters 7 and 8, he got hard visions, visions that terrified him. And yet he pressed into them and said, I want to know what this means, even though it's hard. Are we willing to do that kind of hard work? Are we willing to pray and dig and, and then accept the messages of God's Word? His humility before God. His prayer in chapter 9, confessing the sin of his people, even though he had not been involved in the sin of his people. And yet he saw himself as one of them sinful in need of God's mercy. And then in chapter 10, we learn just, just what God thought of him twice. The angel sent to give him an understanding of a vision and says, Oh, Daniel, man who is greatly loved, you who are greatly loved by God. What carried Daniel through? A relationship where he knew his God. And like those in chapter 12 of Daniel, those who are said would know their God and be able to do great exploits. We want to know how to do that. The amazing thing is, if we'll study this book and we'll commit ourselves to learning the lessons Daniel learned about his God, we can have the same kind of confidence he had. Interestingly enough, at key moments in this book, there's a vision that reminds us of the hope that we have focused on the Redeemer God will send. Whether it's the one like a son of the gods, a son of God, in the fiery furnace or whether it's the one like the son of man receiving all authority the message of the book of daniel is god is on the throne god is all powerful and his leader will lead his people safely home boy when you're living in exile there's nothing more precious than the promise you're going to go home we're living in exile. We're living in hostile times. We're living in the midst of a cosmic struggle. But brothers and sisters, let's not lose heart. Let's realize God is still at work. Even when it seems that God and His people are losing and, and evil is winning, God is at work. If you know this God you can have this confidence. And if you don't know Him, 
He wants you to see His power unleashed in His sovereign control of all events. And He wants you to understand His compassion released through His Son Jesus and the offer of salvation that is extended to you right now. I'm excited to dig into this book. I'm excited because I believe God wants us not to be victims of circumstance. Instead, I believe He wants us to thrive in our Babylon. To thrive and have hope in these hostile times. Father, would You take our hearts now and turn them toward You? Lord, let what I've shared just in setting up our understanding and our study of the book of Daniel be something that that just prompts in us a hunger that says, I want not just to survive in hostile times. I want to thrive in hostile times. I want to be like a Daniel who can, in the midst of this kind of environment, stand firm. Who can shine as a light. Lord, so many of our neighbors and friends are struggling right now. And they need to see examples of those who know their God. Lord, let us be people who set that kind of example. Let us be people who not only have hope in hostile times, but share it. We pray this through Christ our Lord, our Savior, our source of hope. Amen. Grace family, we're going to sing a new song together. It's called Ancient of Days. So don't be worried that you don't know the song. It's okay. We're going to learn it together. Um, It's a song we really think fits well with our theme of studying Daniel uh, for the next couple months. So let's learn this. Let it sink deep into our hearts and let it affect the way that we live and the way that we worship and the way that we understand who God is. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains that my God. Oh
In these hard days, in these hostile times, how's your hope? How's your confidence? I know there are a lot of things that can be upsetting to our minds. What's going to happen? When are we going to be able to go back to work? What about my retirement? What about... There are a lot of things we don't know. If our confidence is in those things, we're bound to be those who are overthrown. But as we've looked at the book of Daniel and as we begin to dig into it, we're going to learn there's a different way to live, even in hostile times. And it begins by knowing our God. Do you know Him? If you're a follower of Jesus, is that knowledge what is, what is your anchor in these things to know that God is in control. God is working out His plans. God has a plan for you even in this circumstance. I hope that's where your confidence is. But maybe you're tuning in and watching this and saying, I'm not sure I know this, God. Oh, He wants you to. You are watching by divine appointment. And I want you to know that God's Word says that if you will seek after Him, you will find Him. The Bible tells us God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. You can have everlasting life. You can know the God who's in control of everything by realizing that Jesus offers Himself as your Savior. We just celebrated Easter, which, which marked both the, the, the death of Christ on Good Friday and the resurrection of Christ on Easter Sunday. The Gospel tells us that as sinners, we stand under God's judgment, but Jesus has taken that judgment, taken that penalty, and offers us eternal life. And you can call on His name today and be saved and as His child, you can have confidence that your Father in heaven sees you, knows you, and loves you. If there's anything we can do to help you understand that, reach out, contact us, email me at millerc at gracecedarville.org. I'd love to share more with you about how you can have the hope that will get you through hostile times.